Good afternoon, everybody. It's really great to be here in, in Limerick again. Um, I think uh, those of you who have maybe heard me a previous time talk about the work of volunteers in localization might have a, a bit of an expectation of, of the kind of things I'd like to talk about. Um, and really, in a way, uh, I think when we hear about the success of Twitter or Facebook, as was discussed at the previous conference, I think we all sort of think this is really impressive and it's such large scales. I mean, I couldn't imagine a translator community of 800,000 people, or I mean, I'm exaggerating, but it was almost 800,000 people, Thomas mentioned this morning. Um, and I think that captures our imagination, but it immediately brings the question to my mind, I'm not Twitter. I'm not anything close to Twitter. I, I can't even hope to play in their league. And I think um, it raises the question about these kind of successes that we've seen specifically in the, in the area of social networks. Does that apply to the rest of us? And that's what I'd like to talk a bit about today. And um, maybe let's just start with a few um, thoughts on what social could mean. Um, I, I was curious to see what pe people's take is on the conference topic because uh, it's a nicely ambiguous word. <coughs> Um, and um, seeing Ryan up smiling now, I assume it was on purpose. <laughs> um, we do a lot of work as an NGO in trying to uplift the languages of South Africa and further afield working a lot with minority languages. Um, but I also thought, you know, um, there are other aspects to social. It's not just all social networks. We had an event uh, that I uh, led in uh, Uganda where it was pretty social. We translated the web browser Firefox in about uh, two days with 200 participants, that's a shot of about, I don't know, less than half of the people participating in the event. It's really atrocious way to translate a web browser, but it was a whole lot of fun. Um, and I think we got a lot of people interested in localization, and actually one of the outcomes from this event is a version of Firefox now in two languages of, of Uganda that's just about uh, ready to release. Dwayne will be talking a little bit more about that tomorrow during his session. Um, another aspect is the one that I think Reinhardt had in mind a little bit more is the one about the social good or the, well that's the, that's the ambiguity. I, I, in Afrikaans we have different words for this, the Motskaplik or Gesellschaftlich or what's the, you know, for the, for the community good. Um, and an interesting project we've worked quite a bit with is the One Laptop Per Child project that had its goal stated initially as a developing this, this small portable computers for children in the developing world for educational purposes. And we've seen similar projects come up now. Um, and it's been very exciting to watch their progress now as they're uh, growing specifically now into languages where the people don't speak English at all. These people are now already translating from other languages for which the localization has been completed before. And they've been uh, found our tools to be very helpful in that regard. Um, but I guess a lot of us are actually interested in the social networking sites and in my preparation I was curious to have a look at the, how, just how big is big. <laughs> now these numbers, please don't trust them because I got them from all sorts of different sources and some of them are definitely not uh, accurate or current uh, and um, uh, so please, well don't ignore them but uh, I don't take them too seriously myself. My space is nothing like that size anymore, I think they're down to something like 20,000 years by now. Uh, and I checked Twitter this morning on the front page now, there's 32 languages and you talked about, I think, the translation center has 50 already activated or something like that. Um, but I was quite interested because I looked at Twitter and Facebook first and I looked at this ratio of the number of users uh, to the number of languages used for the software interface. Of course, there are, there are more aspects to look at. But I was fascinated when initially the first two that I looked at, Twitter and Facebook, were quite closely matched in terms of this ratio and I thought, no, that's... This, this can't really be, but looking at a few of the other popular ones that are really big, uh, it's all within one order of magnitude, which is not what I expected. Now, of course, not all of them use crowdsourcing. Um, this is, uh, we know of Twitter and Facebook having used it with great success, but we know Google, as far as I know, uh, used localization vendors for Google+, Plus, as far as I know. Um, I don't really know about the others, but we can see it all being like somewhere between 2 and 20 million users per language. And now we have to ask that question, okay, I don't take this data too seriously, but what does it mean if I make a niche application or some niche service? Uh, do I ever have a hope of using social local 
accusation. I mean, could I ever play in, in this market? So when I looked a bit further, and I cheated a bit, uh, I included two more. It might be too low on the screen for some of you. But looking at Qzone, who here is familiar with Qzone? I wasn't. Uh, Qzone is an absolutely humongous social network in China. It's available in one language. Uh, so that's uh, really a, a bit of an outlier for my column. And then I had a look at Wikipedia, which is not a social network, but I think uh, very much a poster child of the Web2 uh, revolution. And I was fascinated to see that they managed to obviously break through, break through that barrier very easily. I mean, they're they've available in 275 languages for the user interface of the encyclopedia um, uh, with some level of content in those languages. Now, obviously, for some of them, it's um, less than 100 articles and so on, but it actually has user interface localization. Now, I think that speaks a bit to the motivations of the people taking part. Um, you know, I think it's Wikipedia is a project that speaks to the heart of a lot of people. Um, and I think... Part of it is also the organization of how their localization effort works. If you, these days, if you want to have Wikipedia in your language, you first need to localize the software used for the site, as far as I know, which didn't used to be the rule initially uh, or about you know, seven years ago. Um, so obviously, if we cheat a bit and incorporate something like Wikipedia, we see that obviously some people have managed to break through that barrier. Now, 130 thousand users per language, as we see it there for Wikipedia, um, is probably not very accurate because that doesn't include anonymous users to Wikipedia, which most of the social networks uh, don't really have. Um, but I think we see that there is probably something to be said about the motivations of the people involved. So we had heard something really interesting about motivators earlier this morning, which was, I think, a very interesting thing to talk about in general, what motivates people. So I'm going to go a little bit more specific in terms of people I've worked with, why they contribute to you know, crowdsourcing efforts on the web. Uh, a lot of people want it, but uh, you know, it's not succeeding everywhere. I don't know how good I do in my web to social speak, but a, a common one that we've seen is it is very cool. Um, I think when Google in your language, or Google in my language, what was it called, was started, um, I think it was in the time where people couldn't really do that own, their own web development. Like we just heard, I mean, that was the time for web developers. But you could change Google. That was pretty interesting at that time, I think. And the Google front page grew very quickly to, I think, one of the most multilingual uh, pages of the, of the popular web. Um, we've heard it before, uh, especially, I mean, in, in my work, we've often dealt with people from Spain. And there is definitely an issue of passion about the language and about the, the cultural identity. Um, we see it very much about the pressed languages and, and small minority languages in many places in the world. Uh, and it's definitely part of why I got involved in the whole industry. Um, then there is something that's, that's slightly different, and this idea that people feel that I need to contribute to this cause because it's a good cause. Um, I think that probably explains what we see with Wikipedia, maybe the best. Um, and I think um, we just all can't have that. You know, if I'm a small service provider, I can't necessarily be all that cool. And I can't necessarily be something world-changing right away. Um, you know, I think when you've, when you've become Twitter already, it's, easy to, to, it's easier to draw the people, as, as we've seen people coming today, but when you're not yet, when you're a small startup, I think it's much harder to, to break into this, this place where the crowdsourcing becomes possible. <coughs> uh, there was recently a survey done by the localizers of the Firefox web browser, and it was an interesting thing that came out of that where someone specifically indicated, uh, you can see the quote maybe there at the bottom of the screen, he said, I tried to help Armenian localizers so my grandfather could use Firefox in Armenian. And I mean, it's a quite a personal touch, uh, which is why I included it for the benefit of my presentation. But I think it's interesting to see that for some people, it's not just about their language. It's actually about the people they know directly, because this guy's grandfather probably doesn't speak English at all. And he wanted to give him something in Armenian. And I don't know, but it might even be the only web browser in Armenian available at the moment. And the thing that is also just touched very lightly on in the talk so far is how money becomes involved, and I think it's a tricky thing for a lot of people. Uh, I just overheard <coughs> uh, mentioning it to someone else and how it complicated things in Google when they started to move towards 
rewarding some of the volunteers, and I think it's a very tricky situation to handle well. But it definitely serves as a motivator for some people in some cases. Or let's put it rather differently, in the way I've really experienced it, is people like to ask for money when they do stuff for free. Even if they said up front that they would do it for free. But the issue is that people often like some kind of credit, <coughs> some kind of recognition for their work. Um, I think that one of the most innovative things I've seen, uh, um, there's a gaming company using our, our crowdsourcing platform called Poodle. Well, our platform is called Poodle, the game is called, I think, Supremacy 1914. And they uh, used the sort of point system of the translation platform to award people in-game credits. So you'd be able to do more things inside the game if you've localized the interface or if you've contributed more localizations. And I thought that's quite an interesting way of bringing the, the crowd into your product uh, in a, well, something that I don't think is very obvious, uh, but uh, was uh, quite uh, innovative in my view. Um, but of course there's another side to it. Uh, they aren't just motivators at play, because otherwise you would just need to try to you know, follow the three steps mentioned earlier, or maybe look at some of these specifics. Um, but in truth, it is, um, in my experience and with a few people I've worked with, there are quite a few demotivators that would make people who might want to contribute otherwise just end up not doing it. I just spoke to Adam uh, over lunchtime and he said, well, you know, whenever I sign up for a site, there's never a Spanish string left to translate for me. So, so <laughs> he's just not a big contributor because there are other people who got there first. Um, I think... <coughs> I mean, someone talked about not using crowdsourcing for things like legal translation, and I think uh, there's a lot of uh, truth behind that view. Uh, common ones that I've seen is the issue of scale. Uh, we work with, for example, the open office and Libre office people who build a very big office. <coughs> and the help files are gigantic. It's half a million words. And that can be fairly demotivating, especially if you're a very small team of volunteers. And I think that's an issue that we have to realize that if you give people this humongous amount of work and say, you know, go and translate and see you at the end, that can be very demotivating. So I think an encouraging one that I saw this morning from Twitter is that our things were divided into the different applications. Say, you want to work on the Android client, you can focus on that. You don't need to struggle to find it. And that immediately reduces the scope of your work and it means there are earlier rewards to be had. I want that, I think, because I develop localization tools that usually irritates me quite a bit, or that have demotivated me often, is clumsy tools. A lot of people like to develop an ad hoc tool, you know, in a developer's uh, off week or something like that. And I remember a, a system I, I quickly tried to do in Afrikaans localization before, and I counted that I have to do five mouse clicks for every string. And when I realized that, I decided I've got better things to do with my time. Um, I get the impression people don't offer, often uh, value the, the, the art of, of building a good localization platform. Um, and I think you know, there is something to be said for a, a tool that's really designed for this purpose and that is <coughs> tested in, in, in a wide way or, or in a wide range of applications. Um, weird processes, uh, uh, that's the thing that I've seen people shy away from, they have to sign up to strange services or they have to be on high traffic uh, mailing lists and things like that. And say, but I just want to translate. Now, of course, need, uh, keeping contact is very important, but it's important to solve that in a way that don't demotivate people. Uh, something that I still stumble upon from time to time, uh, I saw the semantic presentation this morning, my language was listed nice, nice at the top, but it's not always there. Often I go and I think, oh, you know, this is, looks quite small, I can quickly do this in the afternoon, but my language is not on the list. And I could probably send an email and ask for it, but I almost never do. And I think it's an interesting thing looking at that. If there aren't a lot of the motivators, or the motivation is not strong, it takes something really small like that to just make someone walk away without contributing. Um, a thing that I met someone uh, uh, two years ago, I think Gmail was still using Google in your language, uh, the crowdsourcing for Gmail. And he said, you know, I've had it translated at 99%, and as the stream's coming, I try to stay up to date, but I can never just get to the 100%, and I don't actually know what I need to do to get it released in my language. And then I asked him, for how long have you been doing this? And it was years. And I didn't realize Gmail was translated in our language for a long time. I don't know if he still keeps it up, but it's still not released. And I think that can be extremely demotivating, and people just give up at some stage. 
And I think that's, that's very important to make very clear what the goals are, what your expectations are of your volunteers. To so say, well, you know, if you get here, I can give you a private access to a test, non-public testing version. Or, uh, you know, you really need to have a look at this. Or, you know, you can look at the mobile client first and only do that and we'll, we'll be willing to release that separately. Because I think it's important to have uh, encouragement, you know, that kind of... Uh, um, Encouragement coming out of the reward of seeing a release or seeing the, your stuff deployed. And then there's the other reality about things just being hard. The legal stuff, uh, I mean, is very hard. People don't always know it, uh, which is the really scary part. But, I mean, when things get really technical, a lot of people just lose interest. Uh, in that case, I think a very clever thing to do that I've seen people do is to use their regional distributors. Uh, you know, people who actually know your product who has to stand, you know, who would benefit from... Uh, localization to say, well, you get involved, you know, someone on your team try to get involved, as we've seen with Symantec doing. And then just a quick note on some things that was mentioned this morning that I, I um, think we need to think through very carefully, and this aspect of voting. Um, voting does, I think, Ryan, you tweeted about it as well, you know, this whole thing of what motivation, you know, what's the motivation in voting and what's the secondary causes of it, um, I think um, no one wants to lose. And if you make the goal to win a vote, people will try to start to want to win the vote and not to do the good localization, which is your goal maybe as a service provider or as a, as a startup doing something new in a new country. Um, and I think it's important <coughs> to think about these, the, the, the secondary causes that this creates in, in the user community to say, well, you know, there's votes or there's this karma system. Um, and I think... Uh, what I got this morning from Twitter is that they thought really carefully about, you know, many factors that should play a role in, in judging a user's ability or, or <coughs> karma, and I call it karma or point system. Um, because I think it, it can be easily game, gamed um, and I think the consequences can be demotivating for other uh, participants. And another thing that I know I've heard of people taking part in Facebook localization is this idea that the people who have got nothing else to do become the, the best localizers because they do the most stuff. And I think that that creates a problem. Um, and I just overheard, I mean, it's just an anecdote, but the guy who said, he was a colleague of mine, and he said, oh, but I see this guy, I know him, he made the comment. And I know he's a professional localizer, he was working on contract for us. And I say, the people ignore him. He's one of the best experts in our language. And people don't realize that because he just hasn't had that much time. Um, and I don't think um, we necessarily need to this professional localizer or necessarily need to uh, you know, make kings of them in the process, but I think it, it is a problem when someone who has nothing else to do becomes your stylistic norm setter, or the one that determines everything about uh, uh, what happens in your in your translations. Often, when I mean, when crowdsourcing was quite new, the the complaints were were very common, and I think a lot of them are still very valid. Um, uh, Doug from Microsoft is not here this year unless I missed him, but I think he always said, you know, uh, I think he worded it as, we're not going to give the crown jewels away to the crowd yet, you know, speaking of Windows and Office. Um, but I think there are legitimate concerns uh, about quality, and I think this morning it was uh, very nicely addressed in what we saw from Twitter studies and ones uh, uh, mentioned in other sessions. Um, there are issues of confidentiality if you want to go to market uh, simultaneously in many languages. Um, legal aspects, things like agreements and licenses and you know, all sorts of trust issues. Um, and the issue of continuity, it's really great if you now manage to get a uh, translator, but you know, what do you do when this guy gets a bit tired or he gets married or you know, he's just not a full-time student anymore? And uh, another one that I think is creeping up now is to say, uh, yeah, we want to look at socializing the process, but what happens if it's so social that people are just having a great time and not really, um, uh, you know, uh, making much progress on your product? I mean, it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's for them to do with their time what they want, I guess, but, you know, if you're not reaching your own goal, I think it's something to just look at to balance. Um, a lot of people used to ask us to, to incorporate forums into our crowdsourcing software, Poodle and you know, initially we said, well, we don't have the developer capacity to even consider this, but I think we've also looked at how there's a little bit of value in saying, well, this is a work tool, and yes, we'll, we're gradually incorporating more social features, but we don't actually want people to be multitasking too badly all the time. 
I just saw another study, I oh, just mentioned, I, I'll be honest, I didn't even read it, but the headline talked about another study confirming recently saying that we basically all people suck at multitasking. We, we don't really know how to do it. You, you can do it, but it comes at the cost of your, um, your productivity and the quality of your work. So here are some of the features. These are um, things that I think are useful. Um, they're a, an extract of some of the features of, of the Poodle platform. <coughs> Um, that I think are useful, and I'll give a justification of a few of them, but we don't have a whole lot of time. Um, uh, I think one of the things where, put, uh, where um, Facebook got a little bit more of credibility, and it was mentioned this day about, uh, about um, Twitter as well, is the importance of actually giving people a glossary. And, uh, you know, it's really not earth-shattering stuff. You know, this is the stuff that's been discussed at this conference for what, decades now, almost. We know that. We know the values of glossaries and, and translation memory and these things. We also know their limits and, you know, people are probably not going to work on, on a glossary of thousands of terms. You know, it might be a demotivator, but I think those things are not hard to balance. And we found people give very pleasant feedback about it. We've recently incorporated translation memory even into our web-based products. Um, and we're still going to rapidly improve some of that. We include some basic translation memory stuff. Uh, we allow uh, people to view a second reference language, which has been used extensively by the One Laptop Per Child project. So the people doing translation into Aymara can see the Spanish because they don't actually understand English. And the Spanish is a human translation, so this is not, you know, a, a, a too bad game of telephone, is, as we call it. Uh, but it allows people to at least see something they're more familiar with and, and then use that as an extra, as, in a sense, as a second source language. And what we've also done is incorporate machine translation services even from these other languages. So even though you're translating from English to, English to um, uh, uh, Catalan, for example, you can use the machine translation from Spanish to Catalan at, at that time. Um, and I think that's an interesting thing that we might be able to expand on in the future. We provide some basic tools for quality analysis, basic checks. I'll give a little bit of an example in a moment. Um, and another feature that for me is very close to my heart is the whole thing of offline translation. I don't think I've seen a single web-based translation system except ours that really make offline translation simple and assume that a substantial number of people will actually want to do that. Um, I mean, if in, 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 the, in the first world, you know, it's only at hotels that infra internet access is really terrible. But, you know, where I come from, it's actually the norm. A lot of people don't have internet access at home or it's very, very expensive. Um, and it's uh, very frustrating if you have to translate string for string online and it's very, very fancy graphics and people's icons and avatars popping up and comments and it's just a lot of stuff and you end up thinking how the money is actually rolling down the wire to your internet service provider. Um, and another reason for that is because I think if you are lucky enough that someone who's a really good translator wants to contribute to your product and they have a cat tool that they prefer to use, you really want them to use it because they'll be more productive. They'll be using, you know, this tool that they know. And I think there's there's something to be said for allowing a person to use the tools of their craft, even if it means not the one I wrote. If, but still, I, I think there's some value in that. So enough text for a while. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the upcoming version. Uh, I know some of you, I think, have already looked at it. Uh, you can see the source text here at the top current translation, and here's the terminology coming from the glossary, and some TM results presented in a very simple way. They scored and ranked, but we don't even show that kind of information, we just sort of show the differences. It doesn't show all of the, the features there, and I think, uh, you know, it can become a bit overpowering, but uh, I think with some careful design, this has been proven to be very helpful for a lot of people. This is already in use for several people translating Firefox, for example, already using this upcoming version. A screenshot of the quality checks. These are the things that would be familiar to a lot of people using CAT tools, but the kind of things that is actually now available in a crowdsourcing platform. And it's now available to everybody. I didn't say initially, but this is open source software. Lots of gaming companies are using this. A lot of the major open source software is using this. It's used by uh, disaster recovery projects like the Sahana Foundation, uh, the TweetDeck project, or Hootsuite, I think they all use it. Um, and this just means that instead of just translating, and then having to have in-house people doing your quality control or having to, to outsource that to an LSP, I think it's very useful to help your translators and say, oh, well, you know what, 
you might just want to pay attention to your punctuation as you were taught in school, or not. You know, someone can now come afterwards and do it for you, for someone else from the community. Um, and I, you know, we try to break it down into stuff that you really need to look at at the top, and some other stuff that's just cosmetic. For some legal stuff, you know, I think it's the kind of thing that a lot of people want. You want to be able to show people what they agree to when they localize. So, you know, you want to keep things confidential, so you want to hide certain projects from certain people, it's the kind of thing that's easily possible these days. A lot of projects, even similar ones, support that. And um, I think the one thing we have to learn about success from Twitter and Facebook is that people live in social networks uh, more and more. I mean, the time when Twitter was on your cell phone, you really couldn't have it ringing all the time, but I mean, people have followed thousands of people. I mean, I, to be honest, I don't really know how they do that. But, I mean, it's quite common. Um, and I think uh, there's something to be learned from how we can incorporate some subtle social features without developing a social network, which we, which we can't do. I mean, we, we don't have that kind of manpower. And I mean, no one does except a few of the very largest players. But now we say well, there is this platform that's available for other people to go and do something like this. So we have a hierarchical trust model you can implement the kind of models we heard about this morning, you know, your trusted group of people, or the people who's been there longer, or your in-house people, or your regional distributor, or whoever it is that you trust more, and for whatever reason. Commenting, voting, at this time we only enabled voting for terminology. Uh, I am personally a bit concerned about, you know, the effect that voting could have. Avatar so that it just integrates a little bit more seamlessly with other social networks. Uh, uh, a timeline of changes to the strings that you can sort of see who contributed here, you know, why did, how do things get here where they are now? Um, social things and news feeds so that it can be mashed up into other services. User profiles showing how active people have been, things like that. Um, but another thing that we're doing that's really not that much part of our own platform is how we um, try to create platforms for socializing outside of our socialized, outside of our localization platform. I'm not going to talk much about that because that's to some extent what Dwayne will be talking about tomorrow in some of the stuff we've been doing with localizing Firefox. So you can see, um, I think the text is probably too small, but it's a, a, a simple part of the term terminology creation tool. Uh, you can add the, the term and the definition. Um, and this on the right bottom, you just see a little bit larger version with voting and you, how a trusted user might be able to reject or accept suggestions. This is a customization we did for a client. It's not in our main product, but we integrated the Discuss. Uh, these people who you might probably saw in lots of blogs using this kind of discussion software that integrates more tightly with Twitter and Facebook, which means that if this page is mentioned on Twitter, it would integrate with this page here, and you would be able to go follow the discussion on the social networks and so on. And this is the kind of thing that we're quite excited to, to explore and to see, you know, what really makes people actually do better and, and more work while retaining them. Because I think the continuity problem is not a problem for Spanish, uh, but it's a problem for the majority of languages if you're really interested in the long tail, especially the really long flat part. So this is some stuff that uh, I've often seen with these, in this kind of space, as most people can't build their own platforms. You know, there's no manpower. If you're a startup to doing a cool service, you've got one or two developers. You don't want to spend your time building a localization platform. Um, and I think it's important to realize that a sound platform with the features that we know work, we know the value of, of terminology, we know the value of, of TM. I think those kind of things will really empower more people. And if you're interested in uh, reaching out to a wider audience, I think this is what is really important. Thank you for your time.